macroeconomics represents half of most introductory economics courses. But the word itself wasn't even in the English language until 1945. So what is macroeconomics? A particular way of looking at the economy on a national scale. Not just one market, but all markets. Aggregate supply, aggregate demand. It was the Great Depression in the 1930s that emphasized the importance of looking at the economy in terms of macroeconomic policy. Unemployment reached 25% in the U.S., one out of every four workers without a job. The economy seemed to be trapped in a downward spiral. Workers without jobs didn't have enough money to spend on what businesses had to sell, so businesses had to lay off more workers who then also had less money to spend. And this happened in market economies all over the world. Things got so bad, in fact, that fascist governments took power in Germany, Japan, and elsewhere by promising prosperity, but bringing tyranny and ultimately provoking World War II. Some people began to hold up Soviet-style Russian communism as a way to avoid the downturns of market capitalism. Central planning would supposedly ensure economic stability, some thought at the time, rather than leave things to the free market. In a sense, macroeconomics was born as a defense of the market system. It analyzed what seemed to go wrong with a market economy so fixes could be made without abandoning the market system itself. The main fix was a bigger role for government in economic policy. Without government taking over the economy, as in socialism or communism. Macroeconomic policy emphasized the use of two key government tools, monetary policy and fiscal policy. Neither of them, it was argued, had been used the way they should have been to avoid the Great Depression. Now, monetary policy is run by the Federal Reserve Bank, which was created not long before the Depression, in 1913. Many economists think that after the stock market crash of 1929, the Fed was paralyzed and that its failure to take action led to the economy-wide collapse. But we'll set aside monetary policy in the Fed for another video. This one focuses on that part of macroeconomics known as fiscal policy, the idea that when people don't spend enough, the government should spend. It can be spelled out this way. Economic output, or gross domestic product, is made up of consumption spending, plus investment spending, plus government spending. That's it. Since in the Depression, C and I were down to a trickle, G, government, had to spend instead. So government gave money to farmers. It spent money to employ construction workers, to build or fix roads, bridges, and the like. It even gave jobs to artists. Such jobs as these dot the map of the United States, giving work and hope to people who can't find jobs. The idea was to ignite the economy. The more people employed, the more money they would have to spend. The more they spent, the more companies would earn, thereby inducing them to hire back the people they'd laid off. We have seen a few of the 120,000 projects that are embraced by the WORKS program. Critics blasted government intervention on this scale as socialist. Defenders responded that government spending was simply saving capitalism from itself. Under this program, work pays America. But one thing was sure. Macroeconomics was a radical departure from what economists of the 1930s had believed. The textbooks of the time taught that a market economy, though subject to ups and downs, should be left to adjust by itself. And why shouldn't it? People are both suppliers and consumers. As workers, they make money. As consumers, they spend it. What can they spend it on but the things that workers make? So supply, according to an old French economist named Say, created its own demand. Even producing the wrong products and services would only cause a temporary problem. Imagine that businesses all started making prune sorbet and they devoted all their resources and workers to making it. And then no one bought it. Sounds dire, says renowned macroeconomist Fred Bergsten, but not in theory. Now, if you make the wrong stuff that people don't want to buy, uh, you certainly have a transition problem because people are not going to buy it at that time. If markets were totally flexible, 
then the production of the stuff people don't want would decline sharply. The production of the stuff they did want instead would rise sharply. And after a transition period, you'd be back in balance. But what led to macroeconomics was that in the 1930s, the transition period seemed to be taking forever. That's because markets weren't flexible. Both prices and wages, in fact, turned out to be sticky. If all prices and wages adjusted, we wouldn't necessarily have a problem. But typically, that's not the case. There's some stickiness in the system. Prices don't always adjust um, in, in a flexible manner, so that at times we get, some, we get imbalances in the economy. Picture supply and demand operating on a national scale for the economy as a whole. Supply in this macro economy is everything suppliers provide, all put together or aggregated, the supply of all goods, all food, all services. Demand is the total demand for all of the above, the aggregate demand. The axes of the graph are still price and quantity, but price is now the general level of prices. Think of it as the average price of any good or service, while quantity is the total amount of goods and services produced. Notice that in this picture, the economy as a whole has a limit on how much GDP it can produce in any given period. That's why the aggregate supply curve is shooting straight up. All resources are being used as productively as they can be. Every company is operating at full capacity. Everyone in the workforce is employed. Now, when aggregate demand is low, more demand means more GDP, an expanding economy. But once we're near the full capacity limit, any more demand will begin to translate into higher prices on the price level axis and slower growth in output on the GDP axis. And past full capacity, any more demand translates entirely into higher prices, inflation. But big deal, you might scoff. All prices rise. Shouldn't that just mean that everyone gets paid more? So everyone should be exactly as well off as before. Well, no, because inflation doesn't affect everyone equally. The problem is, is that while the prices rise, the, the income or wages may not rise as fast as the prices. And so in real terms, uh, workers may be worse off uh, than they were before until those wages can catch up. But usually there's a lag. And so in the, in the meantime, they may not be uh, keeping up their real purchasing power and may actually be worse off because of the higher inflation. So if the price level rises rapidly, wages can have a hard time catching up. Because what if your Big Mac costs 50 percent more every month, and by the end of five months, it suddenly costs $30 to buy a Big Mac? How do, how do you know that your income from your summer job is going to go up by that much? Robert Gordon is a macroeconomist at Northwestern University. So we put the question to him. Shouldn't the market simply adjust? How do you know? It may not adjust. And, it's, and especially the amount you're going to get from the bank, the amount you pay on this old mortgage that you took out uh, five years ago. There are all sorts of, of legal obligations that people have that do not adjust automatically to whether inflation is high or low. And that means everything gets out of whack. The incentives to save and invest get out of whack. Wages and prices get out of whack. So one last time, we return to macroeconomic theory and one of the reasons for a government role. The macroeconomy doesn't adjust as quickly as microeconomic markets tend to. Thus, an economy can, and ours did, get caught in a downward demand shift to the left, which translated into lower and lower output. It took government to get aggregate demand moving in the right direction. One way it did so, with fiscal policy, government spending more or cutting taxes to induce families and or businesses to spend more. But fiscal policy is only one government tool. To manage the usual shorter term ups and downs of the economy, government uses monetary policy. That, however, we will leave for another day, another video.